Hi, guys. It's my wife, Adrian. So I'm glad I didn't have a, check, check. to wonder what this is about. And uh, Tim Tebow was here last year, and he said, I asked him about this conference, and he said that I should come and that people are very sweet. So thank you guys for being sweet because I'm here with my wife. And I love this whole, hi, everybody. You guys are wait, whoa. This is like... <laughs> Hey, check. okay, I am on. There you go. I feel like it's like the wave, the whole full on, like, hi, uh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. It's insane. So I'm going to share a little bit, and I will let my wife speak, but I'm going to kind of share a little bit of my faith journey, and there's a point behind it. I know the, the, the theme is being bold for Jesus and why I am where I'm at. And one of the things that I have said for years is that I'm a minister of the gospel who happens to play music. And for me, my whole heart and mindset since I've been doing what I've been doing is I want to tell people about Jesus. And I've been able to do that for years and years. We've gone to, I've been to 45 countries and able to share the gospel in these places where I can't believe we were able to go. Kyrgyzstan um, was a place that we had some pretty rough things happen, but God opened the door in a beautiful way. And so for me, just to get started telling you the reason why I do what I do is I'm not just a musician, I'm a minister of the gospel. And for you guys, you could be a minister of the gospel who happens to work at a bank, or a minister of the gospel who happens to you know, work in, as a trucker. Whatever it may be, that's what we're considered. Not, we're not defined by the things that we do. I'm not defined by me being a musician. It's my heart for Jesus. You know? And so I'm going to share a little bit of my, my journey, faith journey. Um, I was born January 12, 1978. Just kidding. I'm not going to start there. That's a little too, wow. too far back. Um, I was raised in a Christian home, and... My family really, I mean, we were pretty poor, didn't have much at all, and I really did watch my family learn how to live out their faith. I mean, there was times when we would not have groceries, and this is true stories, and we would pray and say, God, you know, could you provide some groceries for us? And the next morning, have groceries at our front doorstep. And so we'd see these kind of miracles happen. So I was raised understanding faith and taking steps of faith and watching God come through. Um, you know, I remember times, some talk about character building things. Do you guys know what a pony pinto is, anybody? So if you guys do, they had to discontinue pony pintos because if you hit them in the wrong spot, they would catch fire and blow up. We were given two pony pintos. So you start thinking that people don't like you. You know what I mean? If we're giving two of these. So I remember one day my mom pulls up and like I said, character building in ministry. And I look at my mom, I'm probably six years old. And I'm like, oh, hey mom. And it's just kind of rusted out Pinto. And I hop in the car and I look down on the ground. I can actually see the ground because it was rusted out so bad that it was, the floorboard was gone. So I remember sitting down and my mom was like, oh, Jeremy, buckle in. And I saw this belt tied to the door handle. She goes, make sure when we go around corners, you pull that belt in because the door will fly open because it doesn't latch. And so just stories like that were, you know, just learning character building and, and stepping out in faith and God providing. And we got our needs provided. It wasn't always what we wanted, the way we wanted it, but we got our needs provided. And I remember times when my you know, mom, I think I was 13, and our car wouldn't start. And she said, all right, we're going to lay hands on the engine, and we're going to pray that it starts. And I was like, you're crazy. And so I remember we, in front of everybody, we popped the hood, and here we are, I'm we're laying hands on this engine. I'm so embarrassed in front of everybody, looking around as everyone sees me. And by golly, that thing started. And I remember thinking, I'm not messing with my mom anymore. Like, she has got this pathway to God. I just, whoa. And so I really did. I mean, I had that, that watching them step out in faith and watching, that was my faith journey. It was really sweet things that I saw. Um, but I didn't really step into my own relationship until later. And as we all know, I don't have to go into it, you all know that, there's one thing to know about Jesus or be raised in a Christian home. It's another thing to surrender your life to him, to make him Lord of your life. I, that's what I say. He's Lord of my life. And when I was 16, I was already kind of doing my own thing. And I remember um, I was partying. I was doing all the things in the world that I wanted to do. And God gripped me really, really, really hard in a good, gentle way and said, Jeremy, I want to use you, but you're on the edge of a cliff and you're about ready to fall off. And I remember just saying, God, I want to surrender. I mean, also the pastor was talking about revelation. It scared me to death as well. So, but I did make a commitment and say, God, I want to serve you with all my heart. And so I remember just this kind of journey for me, this faith journey that I took on my own. And I didn't know where it was going to take me. I didn't know to the degree that I was going to have to really step out in my own faith journey, in my own faith. And I remember, you know, this is probably... Two years, I went to Bible college for two years, which was incredible. I studied God's word, which I'm so a proponent of 
all scripture is God breathed, inspired. And so I love that I went to Bible college because it really prepared me, I believe, for the ministry and my faith going out into the world, going out into doing what I'm doing. And I'm thankful I had that foundation because it really did solidify that I'm a minister of the gospel. That's what I'm doing. I want to tell people about Jesus. I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel. And so I'll kind of move forward. So then I ended up meeting this girl named Melissa, and she was incredible. She loved Jesus. I remember being in uh, a college, and we were in the middle of everybody, people that were non-Christians that were walking around. And I remember singing worship. And looking at her, and she was raising up her hands, not ashamed of of anyone being around, didn't care what anyone thought of her, raising up her hands, worshiping Jesus. And I remember this kind of feeling that I've never seen before, someone that completely abandoned, saying, Jesus, here's my heart, I love you, I'm going to lift up my hands no matter what, whoever sees me. And that's what kind of drew, drew me to her. And I remember this kind of moment where, you know, I was like, this is the girl I want to be with. And so, you know, we started kind of hanging out, started dating, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to tell her I love her. It's been three weeks. It's perfect time. You know what I mean? Like plenty of time. So I kind of told her, you know, I, I love you. And, and she was like, I can't tell you that right now. You know, a little awkward. Um, but I remember it, it, we just kind of went through this journey together and I watched her just love people, love Jesus, press into her relationship with Christ and fell more and more in love with her. And then she broke it off with me. And that was devastating. I called my mom one time. I was like, what is wrong with you women? You know? And, she was comforting. She says, we're always right. And I was like, oh, okay, so. Don't you forget it. <laughs> <laughs> happy wife is a happy life, as my dad always told me. Um, thank you. I am sweating profusely in here. <laughs> anyway, so I remember um, just this moment of, of devastation. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is the woman I want to marry. And I kind of had moved on, and then I got a phone call and just said, hey, Melissa has cancer. And I remember just being shocked. She was 21 years old, and, and you don't think, I didn't think or know anybody at that age anyway that had cancer. I always thought it was something that you get older. And uh, I was like, okay. So I remember I, I walked in, and we had this kind of moment where, you know, I walked in, her family left the room, so it was kind of an awkward moment. I'm like, why are you leaving the room right now? And as I walked in, I remember her looking at me, and I just, I said, how are you doing? I didn't know what else to say. What do you say when someone's facing cancer that young or at any age, really? And she goes, her face was almost like beaming. She goes, you know what? I'm okay because I realize that no matter what, I'm going to love Jesus and that Christ is my life. Christ is everything to me. And I know it's going to be okay no matter what happens to me. And just that resolve that she had was something that I, I rarely had seen ever. And so I remember her looking at me and just telling me, she just goes, I've been praying for you for a long time. And I know we broke it off, and I know that there was just, God was preparing me for this time. I had to be not with anybody so that I could have preparation to go through what I was about to go through. And I remember just going, yeah, that's, I totally get it. It's okay. And she goes, but I love you. And I was shocked and blown away. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't know what to do because at this point, you know, I, my heart was broken. She was going through cancer. What do I do? And I was like, can I just take a few days? And uh, I went away. And I remember just going, God, I need help. I need wisdom. I was on my knees crying out to Jesus saying, I don't know what to do here because can I handle this? My dad saying one time, you do realize this could be a lifelong battle that you have. And another friend told me, can you live without her? And I was like, no, I can't. So I went back to see her and I said, you know, she's going through chemotherapy and she's losing all of her hair. And I remember looking at her at some point because she was really struggling. And I said, listen, if we're going to get married, you got to tell me everything. I didn't get engaged that night, but it's pretty much my engagement is saying, I love you too. And from that moment on, we went through this battle and this journey together. We got engaged probably about a week later. And I remember going through the whole battle of chemo, going through the whole battle of cancer. And she had lost all of her hair, and it was difficult just to watch that battle, watch that journey. And I remember, though, so many times just to watch her uh, have a resolve once again that no matter what she was experiencing, she was going to love Jesus. And those things didn't deter her from her love for Christ. And so I remember going to the point where we get married. She starts growing her hair back, and she was so stoked to have some hair for the wedding. And we went on the honeymoon, and we on the honeymoon, she was like, I'm having some issues in my stomach. And so I was like, let's not think about it right now. Let's just enjoy our honeymoon. And we get back home, we can, you know, we'll just get tested and see what happens. So we got back home, and doctors pulled me aside and just said, 
well, the cancer has returned and it spread rapidly. Um, and I said, okay, well, what do we do now? You know, what's the next step? And he goes, there's nothing else we can do. She has weeks to months to live. And it's one of those things where you don't think about when you're that age uh, facing death of uh, your young wife. Um, it's something for me, I don't think, oh, I'm going to have to go visit the graveside of my wife so young. That wasn't even on my mind. And so I remember just thinking, no, there's no way. We are going to fight. We're going to battle this. And I remember getting on our knees constantly, crying out to Jesus, having people come pray for her, doing all that we can, pressing into Christ. And I remember many times she would be super weak from the, the chemo. And I remember her saying, Jeremy, I want to I worship Jesus right now. And I would pull my guitar out and I start singing these songs, and she had hardly any strength from the chemo. And she would raise up her hands with every ounce of strength that she had, and she would worship Jesus. And she did that to the day that I watched her go be with Jesus. And I remember the moment that she had passed. I was at her bedside, and I was curled up in a fetal position. I was hurting. I was confused. I was convinced that she was going to be healed from the bottom of my heart. I was like, she's going to be healed, absolutely. And I remember just laying there, and we had worship music playing in the background. And I remember just her sister saying, she's with Jesus now. And it was that moment where I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I couldn't even get up. And God spoke to me and said, Jeremy, I want you to stand up and worship me. And I remember this feeling. I'm kind of like Peter. He had to tell me three times. I'm like kind of dumb, you know? And he's like, right, stand up and worship me. And I remember just being like, the last thing I wanted to do was to stand up and worship God at that moment because he had taken my wife. That's what I felt like. And all of a sudden, I stood up, and I remember with every ounce of strength I had, my dad had to help me up because I didn't have any strength. And I started raising up my hands, and everybody in that room started raising up their hands, worshiping Jesus. And I remember just experiencing, you guys, the presence of God like I'd never experienced before. And when it says, and the Lord says, and the Bible says that he's near to the brokenhearted. He's near to the brokenhearted. And I felt that. And what I believe is that when you make that step of obedience sometimes, like no matter what we go through and endure, God is still worthy to be praised. Amen? And so sometimes you take that step when it doesn't make sense and it hurts and you're confused, but you say, God, I'm going to be obedient. You're going to experience something so supernatural and so radical, it'll blow you away. And you'll experience that presence of God in a new way. I believe that. And I just remember realizing if I would not have taken that step, God was there, his presence was there, he was not going to leave me or forsake me, because his word said that. But because I, I took that step of obedience in the midst of that trial and tribulation, it was like my heart was open. And because my heart was open, I experienced that presence in a real, real way, in the comfort of God in a real way. We're the ones that press it away sometimes. Like, we're the ones that close our hearts off. He's still going to be there, but sometimes we block off and say no. It's like when you are frustrated and someone's trying to comfort you, and you're like, get away from me. You know, it's like we do that sometimes. He'll never do that. But when you open up your heart and say, God, okay, I don't get it. This hurts. doesn't make sense. Watch the comfort. Just be blown away by his presence like you never have before in your life. And this, and this is kind of where I'm going to talk about a little bit of where God kind of took me. And then, of course, I'll let my wife speak. I'm, I'm talking a lot, but <laughs> I'll let you speak, I promise. Um, I remember at that moment, there was kind of a, a moment where I remember that the Lord just really laid something in my heart because I remember having kind of a, a choice to make. It was, all right, do I turn my back from God because I was super frustrated? Times when I would throw my Bible across the room, being angry, asking the question why. But I thought, I'm going to turn my back from God, but if I do that, I'm going to run into the cause of the problem in the first place, in the world, where there's no hope, there's no peace, and there's no joy. Or I can run to the arms of Jesus, who provides all the hope, joy, and peace that we need. And making that decision, of course, was the best thing I could ever do. But because of that step, I remember just the resolve in my heart. I remember just saying, God, no matter what happens, I want to serve you with all of my heart. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because you have gotten me through this. Why would I not want to tell the world that is hurting and needs hope that the hope is in Jesus? And for me, my testimony and my story, they ended up doing this um, film in my life called I Still Believe. And which was an incredible, crazy journey because I've always been bold. I've always, I've never compromised. I love God's word. I love sharing my faith. I remember getting to this point where this Hollywood, you know, producer, director, uh, 
studio, Lionsgate was like, we want to do a movie in your life. And I remember getting to this point where I knew I would have this opportunity to be in the mainstream realm to share my faith. And, you know, you had Lieutenant Dan playing my dad, so that's crazy. Shania Twain played my mom, you know, which is like still nuts to me. Um, so we just, this kind of experience where we are like, this is crazy. Like, this is a real open door to share my faith. And I remember thinking, I cannot wait to be bold. I cannot wait to share what got me through this in my life. You know what I mean? And, you know, I just remember we got to this, these interview panels where it's 50 people. It was, I think, 50 interviews in two hours. They're all mainstream interviews. And they all were asking me all these questions. And I couldn't wait to answer because I couldn't wait to share that Jesus was the reason why I got through what I went through. And this is why I want to encourage you. Your testimony, when you share what God has done in your life and how he's changed you and radically gotten you through, no one can argue with that. And I remember when they were asking me these questions, at the very end, I'd always say, why would I not want to share with somebody who's hurting and needs to find hope that Jesus Christ was the one who gave me hope? Why would I not do that? If you have the answer or a cure to something that's hurting, why would you not want to tell somebody? And no one can say anything. I even say, even if you don't believe that, this is what God has done for me. And my encouragement for you in that is that your boldness of just sharing what God has done in your life. And you've heard this. It's your testimony. You know, we'll, it's, it's the overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony. We're sharing what God has done in our life. No one can argue with that. And I think that I've had so many open door conversations, so many times where I've spoken in front of people in Kyrgyzstan where they were threatening our life, where I'm just sharing my story. They were saying, you can't share the gospel. You can't share, you know, you can't proselytize. And I'm up on stage sharing my story about my Jesus and what my Jesus did for me. They can't say anything about that. And yes, there could be persecution, of course, one day. And if that, so be it. I'm still going to stand strong, but I'm going to do it in love. And I think that's one of the things I learned in stepping into this kind of new realm for us is you have to do everything in love. Because if you're not loving someone, no one wants to hear what you're talking about. And I think for me, it's like that's with our kids, too, something we so pressed into. And my wife, you guys, our, our whole story, too, is I want to brag on her, and I'm let you share a little bit, too. Um, so everyone's like, how can your wife... Let's see what I'm going to say. Oh, well, I'm going to say, how can your wife... I'll say this, and you can kind of like, how can your wife talk about... She was supposed to do what I'm going to say. Um, watch you talk about someone else, you know, the, the, the love of your life and a movie being done about... And she told me this, and this is where I'll just stop and you can go on. She said this to me. She goes, Jeremy, the reason why, she goes, because it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about Melissa. It's about Jesus. And go for it, because that's, I have to like, (laughs) and I'm taking my jacket off because I am so hot. He totally stole what I was going to (laughs) say. But um, before I start, um, my name's Adrian, and I'm from South Africa, for those who are wondering why I speak with a weird accent. Um, I'll back up a teeny bit. Um, When I met Jeremy, I I was raised in a Christian home. I've been in and out of church environments my whole life and um, have always, always loved Jesus as long as I can really remember. I mean, I don't have memories without a knowledge of him and a love for him. Um, But I came over here for music when I was 19 years old. And in the Christian music scene, and unfortunately, what I had seen was incredibly discouraging to me. I saw so much hypocrisy. Um, and as a 19-year-old, I, I didn't know what to make of that. And so I was like, I love Jesus, I'm good with Jesus, but the church, I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure about these people. I see people getting up and, and declaring that they're following Jesus and they're declaring that God is the way and then I'm seeing these really horrific things off stage and the two don't go together and I have a problem with that. I want something to be authentic. And so it, I got really jaded um, and just hard-hearted and just confused about all of that stuff because I was like, I, I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying these testimonies that I'm hearing when the lifestyle is not backing it up. Cue where that was and I met Jeremy um, we were not each other's types at all at first. I was not impressed. I was like, could care less. I didn't. <laughs> I was all like artsy and you know all of that stuff. I was not expecting to marry like Mr. Jock dude, you know. But anyway, that's besides the point though. 
But the thing that really drew me to Jeremy was his testimony, and actually Melissa's as well, because I just thought you do not stare death in the face and watch your wife die and still stand up and go, I trust God and I believe that he's faithful. You cannot make that up. Like that is real, 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 real. And so I want to take a few different tangents. The first thing is, is you guys, as believers, we have to. We are representing Jesus to the world around us. We're going to blow it. We're not always going to do a great job, but it has to be real. And if you find yourself in a place where it isn't real, God gives us the sweetest thing that we can do. We just get to come to him and be honest about it. There have been many, many times where I feel like I've not necessarily been on fire for the Lord, but it's just a simple thing of going, God, I need you to give me a new love for you, you know? Being raised in a Christian home, I don't know how many of you have, but Jesus is familiar to us, right? Like, some, some of you weren't, but there have been times I've found myself really praying, like, Jesus, be new to me. Reveal yourself to me again. Like, I want a new revelation of who you are. And God is so infinite, he is able to provide, us, provide that for us. He's never-ending. His faithfulness is never-ending. His spirit is never-ending. His love is never-ending. All of those things. And so we can never stop learning who God is and having new and fresh revelations of him, right? It's totally in Scripture. It's everywhere that God continues to reveal himself to us. And so as believers, we need to be making sure that our lifestyles are representing Christ And I loved um, what Lee was sharing, just those practical ways. It's like, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, let's look like Christians. Like he even said, use, if you have to use words. But I hope and pray that all of us have a real relationship with God that's obvious to the world around us. And all of that was when I looked at Jeremy and Melissa and I saw them facing some crazy situations. I just thought that's real and that's what I want. I want something that's authentic. And so I would like corner him and ask him hundreds of questions. Like, tell me about Melissa. What was she like? Tell me about this. I just was so hungry to know something um, just authentic and genuine and a real love for Jesus. And from that, I think when Jeremy says, you know, how can I sit up here? I mean, I've heard him share his testimony so many times and even going through the movie. um, Whew, it's hard not to get emotional. I actually sat the producers down before and I said, I just want you to know, like, because I know that you might hear it from Jeremy or even from some of our management and stuff, but I want you to know from my own mouth that if there is no place for me in this movie, you don't have to put my character in here. Like, don't feel like you have to weave me in the story. And this is the reason why I'm able to do that. It doesn't mean that there's times that I haven't been insecure. There's not... I'm not saying that there's times that I've just been like, oh, I'm sure you wish you were married to Melissa right now and not me. Like, of course, we have insecurities and we have those moments and things like that. But you guys, and this is what I said to Jeremy, it is not about us. It's not about any one of you guys. It is absolutely about Jesus. And if Jesus isn't first and foremost the thing, the one that we're chasing, it's, it is amazing for us to be bold. We're all for it. We've raised our kids that way, and we'll share some things about our kids later on too. But it is so good for us to be bold. But the main thing, you guys, is Jesus. It is Jesus, it is Jesus, it is Jesus. And if we are not absolutely in love with him, like Jeremy said, that he is Lord of our lives, that's the place that everything else is going to flow out of, right? I was reading just this morning. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Amen. I'm just going to leave right now. I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I was reading this morning, and it's just the scripture, guard your heart, because it is out of it... A, the the wellsprings of life, right? Out of it, it flows the wellsprings of life. And I was just thinking about what is that guarding of our hearts? It's protecting our love for Jesus. Because there, listen, nobody even needs to say anything to know that there are so many crazy things going on in our world. Politically, there's so much division within the church, outside of the church, and all of these things. I'm not saying they're not important. Please hear my heart in this. But we have to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is Jesus. It is absolutely Jesus. I'm going to share one more story, and I really hope that you hear my heart in this. And I don't want to really tread on anyone's toes. But um, Jeremy and I have really prayed very 
intentionally about ways that we can raise our kids to, um, to learn to share the gospel and how can we do this as a family. We've taken our kids on loads of mission trips, which I highly recommend that you do. Um, we've read missionary stories to them and just really try to live missionally as much as we can. And a few years ago, I got to take my two, well, actually all three of the kids, right? I got to take all three of the kids to, um, to Palestine. And we, lived, we stayed in, in Palestinian territory, and we went, and um, I'm not going to share too many details publicly, but needless to say, we were in some not-so-safe places. And, um, but in, in one of those places, yeah, Jeremy's such a trooper. Uh, growing up in South Africa, I'm like, I don't see what the big deal is. Let's just go. <laughs> and he's like, woman, are you crazy? These are my kids. <laughs> I did not go over there and send them. I no, was on no, tour. No, he was on tour. He had other things. You yeah. can go to Palestine. No, he... I'm <laughs> But all of that to say, we got to meet and share the gospel with some incredible Muslim people. We also got to meet with some persecuted um, Christians who are persecuted um, all around from so many different from people. And the pastor sat us down and was sharing. And when I'm talking persecution, you guys, I'm not talking about like somebody called them names on Facebook, like really devastating stuff, like where husbands are not returning home because they've been killed for the gospel, okay? This is real persecution that our brothers and sisters are facing in other parts of the world. And the pastor said to me, he goes, the problem with the church in the West is he said too many people are trying to go around the cross. And he goes, you cannot go around the cross of Jesus. And I just, it was one of those moments that I was like, oh, holy cow, I feel like I'm probably never going to hear anything more just like right on, right? That it was just like as believers, we have to lay down our rights. We have to follow Jesus all the way. And in, as we're doing that, it's like I was reading in Romans this morning, as, we're, as we lay down our lives for Christ, there's also the resurrection power that we get to walk in. And sorry, this is gonna be super cheesy, but Jeremy has a song called Same Power. <laughs> The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in me, and that is the power that we get to walk in, and that's where the boldness comes from. It's, it's that surrender, Jesus, you're all, you're everything to me. We cannot go around the cross. And the West is so good at providing comforts for us, right? We live in an insanely beautiful country. America is so phenomenal. It's so many different things. But sometimes we've just got to really remember that we've got to embrace just that simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the resurrection power will fill us. And that's when we will be a light to the dark world around us. That's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, you can just drop the mic right now if you want. Just, just drop it. It's perfect. I'm going to piggyback on what she said real quick. Because um, one of the things that I've learned, my life verse that I love is Acts 20, 24. It says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. I may finish this race with joy and the ministry set before me to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And I remember after my wife passed, that was the scripture that I held on to. It became my life verse. And, but I'm going to share a story. I'll share Kyrgyzstan's story a little bit because we have a little time. So we're, we're like, you guys mind if I share another story with you guys? Okay. Um, so I would say that I didn't quite understand when I watched Paul sometimes, and I'm like, how could Paul go through all this suffering constantly and have this resolve and was just like, it's all good. And I mean, of course, you, you know why, but to actually experience it and truly live it out is a whole different thing. And I remember we got asked about, man, it was, was it 10 years ago now? Or not quite, somewhere around there, to, I have an organization called Speaking Louder Ministries. We go overseas and we do these evangelistic kind of crusades and, and outreaches. Um, and we got asked to go to Kyrgyzstan. And Kyrgyzstan is predominantly Muslim country. And our friends were missionaries. And they were like, we really feel like we need something here desperately. Um, the churches are afraid. Um, there's persecution in other parts, not quite as much in our area, but there is persecution, but not some of the killings that were happening in some of the nearby villages. So they're in Bishkek, and he said, we really need something desperately to, in a sense, shake up the church. So, of course, I told my guys, I said, I'm letting you guys know this is not a safe place, so I want you to pray about it. I want you to talk to your wives, talk to your families, and see if this is what you really feel like that you want to do. And every one of my guys 
felt like God saying to go, and every one of the wives felt like this, they were supposed to go, which that's just kind of a testimony in itself of the guys that I have that you'll see tonight, their hearts, that's who those guys are. They're willing to go in these different places saying, no matter what, I'm going to, for the gospel, the sake of the gospel, lay down my life. So, you know, we were, we were like, okay, God, if you want us to do this, he confirmed it. We ended up going to, we had an outreach in Ukraine first. So we did, this is before everything all happened with Ukraine. So we actually played in Kiev, which I will say this. When you guys get opportunities to, to share and do different things, really, really relish in those things in a good way and just be like, oh my goodness, I want to make sure I'm, I'm really present because I look back and go, oh, I wish I can go right now and do the same thing because I'm, I'm dying to go and be with the people and do an outreach. But of course we can't right now. But I remember just thinking back then, nothing like that happened. And my heart was like, I can't wait to go to Kiev, Ukraine. We played this outreach. God used it in a really special way. We all were kind of blown away at God's hand on this outreach. And then our next trip, we were going straight from there to Kyrgyzstan. And I remember, so we started flying to Kyrgyzstan on this kind of crazy high. We're so excited. You know, people got saved, and we were just amped up. So here we are flying to Kyrgyzstan, and we land, and you guys immediately I felt this oppression. And what was the, the letter that happened, or the article that happened? You know what I mean. Yeah, the, article the day came out. that, I think it was, was it CBN maybe, I think released an article the day that the guys landed in Kyrgyzstan that said that Christians are going into hiding and that um, by sharing your faith publicly, you can be put in prison or persecuted. Um, that was the day that they landed. It was like, wow, okay, this I is what like, we're I was like, perfect timing. <laughs> So, so we found that out when we landed. So it was great. I felt great about that. And uh, so I remember just, we had a first, our first kind of press conference because, of course, we were playing in, in the stadium in the middle of the city. So we had this press conference where all these mainstream press were there. And, of course, I had to be careful with what I said and how I said things. And I remember just the, the questions. And one lady in particular just kept saying, but why are you here? Why are you really here? And I just kept sharing. I said, you know, I just want to bring, and I shared my testimony. I shared what God did for me. I said, I just want to share the hope of, of how God changed my life and, and gave me hope in the midst of me going through the, the loss that I went through. A little bit of an appease, I guess, but you can tell that all, all of a sudden there was this press against, there was a pressure. It was oppressive. The enemy was definitely not happy we were there. And so I remember we, you know, here we are doing all these different press events, just trying to get people to come and the people in the city to come. And I remember doing an interview, and I was a little more probably bold. I mean, I'm always bold, but you have to be careful. I, I didn't want to just, when you go into different areas, guys, like I've been to India, and you talk about Jesus, you know, saving your life and being the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and die and rose again for you. All of them will say, I'll take him because there's a million other gods. I'll just put him to to work with my other gods. So you have to really know where you're at in the areas that you're playing. And know, you know, can't just go in and say the same thing. You have to really study and say, what am I, where am I at? What's the culture? And so going in here, I knew I had to be careful with the things I said and how I said it. Because I wanted people to come that night when we actually was going to share the gospel. So we ended up doing this youth event. And I remember doing this youth event. And everybody there, I remember they came up for prayer. And I felt there's a wall all night as I was trying. We we're doing this youth event. It was in a building. It was not out in the open. And all night, I just felt this wall. And people were coming up constantly saying, we're fearful. We're fearful. We're fearful. And before I went on, I remember my um, friend said, he was walking beside me. And he goes, okay, we'll take care of that later. And I was like, take care of what? What's going on? I was already on edge a little bit. I'm like, take care of what? He goes, well, I'll tell you after the event. And I'm like, no, no, I'd like to know now, please, you know. And uh, he said, well, your interview sparked the city. Um, they realize why you're here now. And um, it's all over the news to not come to this event, that it's, uh, it's provocative in nature, and it's going to agitate the people, so don't come to this event. And my name's all over Bishkek, Jeremy Camp. And so I remember he said, and they said they might not let us do the event. And if they do, then if I say the wrong thing, they're going to put my friend in prison for a year. And I'm like, wait, what? So he goes, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with it later. So I'm like, <laughs> so I walk on the stage and we're like singing and I'm like just feeling this like oppression. And, and then finally we had this breakthrough that happened that God was just people weeping and I had a breakthrough. And I remember 
just getting on my knees, and my, my drummer, who you'll see tonight, I remember him coming and laying hands on me because he saw that I just felt that oppression, and I felt just a heaviness about me. And so that night, we went to a restaurant, and I was walking around, and, you know, I was going to the bathroom. I had a bodyguard, an ex-KGB guy was with, with me, big old guy, Vatalig. And he was following me everywhere. And, like, it was kind of awkward. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to the bathroom. Like, leave me alone, you know. And uh, I remember coming back to the seat, and I looked at my friend, who was not dramatic at all. And I said, Jed, um, should I watch my back? And he goes, yeah. And it just hit me that my name was everywhere. They were telling everybody in the, in the place, don't come to this place. It's this Christian guy is here. And I went back, and I remember calling her. She picks up, and I just lost it. And I started weeping. And she's like, what's wrong, babe? And I was like, I don't think I'm coming home. And she's like, what do you mean? And I told her what happened and, and what was happening around us. And uh, what she said to me was, Jeremy, you're called for such a time as this. And I went, okay. Yeah, but tell what you were going through your mind. Yeah, don't cry. because. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so I had... Um... Obviously, we knew there was a lot of just crazy stuff around this um, event and um, a lot of prayer, but I was at church that night and I was just worshiping the Lord and just pouring out my heart to the Lord, just going, God, I need, I need comfort. I need your peace. I need just to know that things are going to be okay. And as I was just worshiping and singing, um, all of a sudden, I just got this picture in my mind of the woman with the issue of blood, which if you don't know the story, it's a phenomenal one. It's in the Gospels. And it's about this woman who was really, really sick. And um, there was this huge crowd in front of her in this picture in my brain that it was almost like I was almost seeing through her eyes. And I just felt like the Lord impressed upon my heart and just spoke to me and said, whatever happens, I want you to push through the crowd and touch the hem of my garment. And it was just this moment where I felt like God was saying to me, this isn't a promise that everything's going to be okay, but it's a promise that everything's going to be okay. Um, I couldn't say from that moment that I knew, oh, Jeremy's going to come home and everything's going to be great. And, but I just knew that God's promise was that his presence was with me and that no matter what we were going to face, alone, together, whatever it was, is that Jesus is worth reaching out for. And that's the healing comes when we reach out to touch him, right? And so anyway, so that was going through my heart that I felt like God had given me the freedom and the boldness. So when Jeremy called me, I was just like, no ways. Like, game on. We're doing this. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're doing this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was there. <laughs> so I remember, I remember this, and she even told me, she said, you're coming home. And then later she was like, I didn't I actually know that. Feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So I remember I, I, I was hopping in the shower, and, and I literally was saying, I, was, I felt so much pressure on me. Because like, it was my name, it was me coming in there, and I just felt pressure on me. My friend could be put in prison for a year. And I just go, Jesus, I can't do this. Oh my gosh, I'm going to cry. Oh. And I remember him saying, perfect, now you can do it. Now you can do it. And it was that spot where you just go, oh yeah. When I step outside of me trying to do something and I allow him to fully take control, to fully walk in his power, to fully walk in his spirit, then you can do it. And then I remembered, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. And it hit me. Oh, sorry. And I went, That's how, because Paul knew his life was not his own. Mm -hmm. He'd already surrendered his life. He already said, Jesus, I don't care what happens. Like, I'm, I'm going to serve you no matter what. And that is that moment for me where it just hit me. I was like, that's what that means. God, my life is yours. No matter what happens to me, I'm going to serve you to the day that I die. Yeah. So I remember the next day as we got there and, you know, we had the stadium started kind of filling up. And I remember we had uh, my, a lot of friends coming in saying, I had to drag some people out because they were like, we're going to snipe you. And I mean, this is true stories. It's not me just embellishing. Yeah. And so I'm going, okay, this is serious. Now, I remember, though, having this peace that I've never had before in the midst of, like, crazy chaos. I remember my bodyguard walks in, and he just had this fearful look on his face. And I was like, what? you okay? You know, and he's like, crazy out there. I was like, okay. And he, he puts his hand in his shirt, and he starts doing, like, a heartbeat going fast, you know. It's like, his heartbeat is going really fast. And he goes, 
if, if you go down, we go down together. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean? That is not What's comforting. happening out there? <laughs> That's not comforting for my bodyguard to say. So we were singing this song and we're like, we're getting ready to go out. And I remember like we had the, this guy that brought up a truck right next to the stage and he was praying to Allah and we're like, Oh Jesus, please. And this whole like, but I remember we started singing and my guitar player, you'll see him tonight, red haired dude, Toby, he started singing, Oh my God, you will not delay my refuge and strength always. And I remember just my, my foes surround me was, you know, one of the lyrics and that song just he will not delay. And I remember just all of a sudden this peace that overtook me. And as, you, as we were kind of praying and asking, is it supposed to rain? The clouds around the stadium, this is true, this is crazy. The clouds around the stadium was dark, black clouds. And right where the stadium was, we we're playing, was as clear as day. It was like God was yeah. right there. Yeah. It was incredible. We have a picture of it. Just mm-hmm. And I remember walking out and like, here we go. And I had such a peace. I had my, my head up high. And there's a picture that they sent me that someone took. I didn't know they had taken this picture. It's me walking like this, kind of smiling. And my bodyguard's like this, like really <laughs> intense, like flexing, looking around. And I'm like, oh, okay, that was happening. And I didn't really realize that was going on. And I remember my, my bass player at one point, we were talking about how I was going to leave the, the stage because you know, we knew that there was going to be probably a little bit of an uproar, not crazy, but just that, you know, some, we didn't know what was going to happen. So I was like, hey, I'll sing this song, and then you guys just start walking off stage, and I'll just stay there, and I'll just keep singing like a worship song, just to kind of, and he goes, no, you walk off first. We follow you. And I was like, what? And just the heart of them saying, we want to follow you. Like, we want you to walk off first. And of course, I was like, no, I'm like, we're like fighting. No, I'll walk off. You know, you guys walk off first. Because our love for each other was there. Like, we love you. You know, like, I love you. And so I remember getting on stage, and we had about 8,000 people there. Actually, no. More? They thought it was about 10,000 people. Yeah. Um, as soon as Jeremy started singing some of the songs, though, like, Jesus, you are the way. <laughs> A few people started leaving. People left. <laughs> yeah, a couple thousand people. So maybe it was eight thousand because yeah. people left. But I remember having such a peace. I had one moment of, of fear. There's one moment, and that was very fleeting. I remember just sharing and sharing freely, but but saying I felt like where I was speaking. And this is one of the things that God showed me. My dad was there, and I remember him saying to me, "Jeremy, I've never seen you so anointed." And I remember thinking, "That's crazy," because I felt like that I would like share. And a lot of times I would kind of be in a flow, and then I felt like this Holy Spirit just stopped. And I, so I stopped, because I'm like, I don't want to say anything that would send my friend to prison. So I felt very discombobulated all night. I felt like I wasn't sharing well, but I just would just share, and then I'd stop, and then play the next song, and then share and stop playing the next song. And that's when I realized it was like I opened my mouth and only spoke what the Holy Spirit wanted me to speak, and there was power in that. And I think that we so often put our own thoughts, our own... You know, we are trying to articulate the best in all these different things. I'm not saying don't articulate well. I'm not saying don't study well. I'm not saying that at all. But let the Holy Spirit be the one that dictates what happens. Because that's when you actually see things happen. You know what I mean? And so we went through the night. And uh, um, it was awesome. The guy, my pastor friend, stood up and said, if these Americans can come up here and share boldly about their faith, how can we not? And uh, we had end up had a, we had a fly out that night because it was getting a little crazy. We fled that night. And it's crazy that when I, we flew through Ukraine, when I got to Ukraine, you never think you were going to kiss the ground in Ukraine. I kissed the ground in Ukraine. I was like, yes, you know, because I felt safe. I wouldn't do that probably right now, you know, to be honest. But, like, I felt so safe being in Ukraine. Um, but I remember just it was such a, a moment of letting this life not be my everything, just saying my life is not my own. And... I want to encourage you guys. That's one of the things. We'll leave you with that. And then we're going to do a couple questions that you guys had. Um, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. Our life is not our own. When you give your life to Jesus, you become a bondservant. You say, Jesus, how do you want me to live? What do you want me to do? I'm willing to. You direct my path in everything. And I'm telling you, if you do that and you're led by him and you follow his ways and not... Our culture is saying that do whatever you want to do to make you happy. Uh, you're going to find some radical things happening in your life and in through your life. 
but your life is not your own. So remember that. When the comforts of the world try to pull you aside, say, no, my life is sold out for Jesus, being bold for him. Amen? Amen. Ah, you're going to let us choose? Okay, so we get to choose? All right. Nope, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, like this? Okay, I'll start while you're looking. Oh, you, okay, you're giving me that one? Yeah, those kind of go together. Um, okay, we'll start here. Okay. Jeremy, okay, I'll start first, then you go? Yeah, okay. go for it. Jeremy, we know you have a very busy concert schedule. How do you keep each concert spirit-led? Um, Ooh, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Uh, you know, one of the things I, and me and my guys, we do every single night is, you know, sometimes before you go on, you'll see bands, they'll say a prayer and go on stage. Um, we actually have a prayer meeting before you go on stage. So what, every single night, each one of my guys, I mean, and they pray. They're prayers. They love praying. And we sit around and each of us pray what's on our heart. And you hear the heart for the people that night. You hear the heart to say, and for me, I always say, I want new manna. I don't want to live off the old man. I don't want to go off. And listen, we have our schedule. We have things. I have things that I say every night, but it's always allowed to let. We even say, God, if you want to take us this direction, take us this direction. If you want us to, to stop here and do that, we'll, we're willing to. And it's just giving him room, the Holy Spirit room, because we all have our schedules. We all have the things that we want to do. It's like man plans his ways. That's good. Plan your ways. Don't be out of control. You know what I mean? Have some kind of but let God direct your steps. Let him take you and say, you plan that, I don't want you to do that. I say, okay, and be willing. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned. It's that, it's the prayer time, it's my own personal relationship with Christ, pressing in, I have to spend time with him to have that fresh manna. So, yeah, just like that. There you go. So, that's, for, that's for all of us, you know what I mean, really. All right, babe. Um, these three actually are about our kids. So I'm kind oh. of going to... Mix them all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love it. Okay. So we have three kids. The question is how many kids do you have? We have three. Our oldest, her name is Bella. She is 18, and she is currently in Norway right now. Ah, cute tears. She turned 18 on the 25th of September and then and left, left the, the 26th day. of September. <laughs> It's like, you want to leave that bad? Um, she has wanted to be a missionary since she was a young girl. And so she's doing a YWAM missions training course um, in Norway right now. And it is absolutely beautiful to see how she's encountering God and um, just falling more in love with Jesus and more in love with scripture and the word and just all of those incredible things and being surrounded by like-minded people. Um, so that's really sweet. Our middle, her name is Ari. She's 16 and is about to start driving. Prayer is appreciated. Pray for us, yeah. We've, we've done one, and I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go again. And then we I have... I have more gray hairs for sure, <laughs> definitely. And then we have an 11-year-old son. His name's Egan. And um, all three of our kids are incredibly musical. Um, I don't know how they got that. No. Very strange, because music's not a part of our life at all. But um, so one of these questions is, do you want your children in the music industry, and why? Yes, no, why? Um, I don't think Jeremy and I have ever said that we wanted something in particular for our kids, except for we really have prayed and prayed and prayed that they would love Jesus. Um, we've sat them down very intentionally at times and just to give them the freedom of walking in the fullness of what they're good at um, and just literally saying, like, we just want you to serve the Lord above and beyond, whether it be in any, whether it is music or not. Um, you know, just really praying through the giftings that they have individually. But coincidentally, all three of them are very musical and write songs and play music. So it's kind of like watch the space. Um, do you want to answer about yeah. them being in the music industry? Well, I, I just think, too, one of the things that you just never know. Like my daughter, when she was probably 11, she oh, looked yeah. at, we were in the garage. I was cleaning up. And she goes, Dad, I don't want to do what you do. And I was like, okay. And like, yeah. I just I said, <laughs> I don't care at all. I said, do you just love Jesus? Whatever you do, just do that with your whole heart. And she's the one that wants, wants to play it. music now. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's what she wants to do totally. for a living. So, yeah. so you never know. I mean, they might, yeah. God might change it because he's like, actually, that's what I want you to do. Yeah. So I have to kind of listen to that because I'm going, okay, she was determined not to do what I do. And now that's what she wants to do. So I think that I want to really support because obviously some, something shifted in her yeah. heart. And it could be the Lord laying on her heart. And I think that 
I've never encouraged them to be in the industry because it's not easy. Like, it's just not. There's a lot of pitfalls, a lot of traps. I think the only reason why I have a little more peace about it is because um, I can at least be there to help guide Mm -hmm. and say, this is what I did wrong. (laughs) Don't do this, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, But not like, yeah, exactly. Just to help kind of guide her. So I'm thankful that I have, there's some great things in the industry. It's just like churches. There's some not great churches and there's some really great churches. Yeah. Some not great people in the industry and some really great people. Mm-hmm. Just be discerning. Yeah. So anyway. What are you going to say? Is that, is that yeah, the, go for the it. Answer well, it. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Well done. Thanks. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks. Um, this jacket being off is like saved my <laughs> Jerry's life. Jerry's like, I'm I a was human. pouring That's sweat. Great. I was like, why am I sweating? Uh, the next question is, what tips would you give to parents on raising godly children in today's world? We could literally sit here for a very long time. Um, so I'm yeah. trying to think about how to answer this um, in, a short, in a short way. Um, number one, prayer. Because yeah. just remember, our enemy is not flesh and blood, right? Scripture tells us, so, and that will lead me to the second one, scripture. We have to know the truth. We've got to, got to, got to know what the truth is. Like we are a family that scripture is very, very important to us, as is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and yeah, sorry, just make time for the Holy Spirit to have room in in your home. We sit down, and during COVID, actually for us, I know it was very, like, incredibly difficult for a lot of people, but we used that time to sit down together, and we just started reading different books of the Bible together, and sometimes, you guys, it's not easy. It feels awkward. And I mean, at, at first, when we started doing that as a family, the kids were distracted and we were discouraged, but we just kept on with it. And it wasn't something to where we were shoving it down their throats. It was like just praying, God, grab a hold of their hearts. So I think that those two things of just like really being prayerful for each of our kids, that God would reveal himself to them. And then scripture being a part of, of your life primarily first, Right. Because we can't teach our kids something that isn't a part of our daily lives. They're, they're going to see us modeling our walks with the Lord. So our kids see us reading our Bible and, and practicing those things. Um, the other thing is, is that when we blow it, which we do, we were super like, hey, I messed up. Please forgive me. We're very much like practice humility in our family. Because, thank you, I... I want my kids to see that I need Jesus. Like, I don't want them to think that it's just them that need Jesus and I've got it all figured out because we don't. We're so, like I said earlier on, there is infinitely many things to learn about who God is. And so the thing that I just want my kids to see is that Jesus is real to me in the way that I apply scripture to my life, in the way that I'm living out my relationship with them. Um, and in part of that is for the times when we blow it to, to own it and to walk in humility. Or if I am struggling to say very vulnerably, like, these are the places that I want you to see that I, I need Jesus. Did you want to add anything? No, that's to great. That? I think also, too, just, you know, one of the things that we've done with our kids is when you ask them, how are you doing? It's everyone in that question anyway, I think, uh, has a knee-jerk reaction to say, I'm good or I'm okay, whatever. You don't really actually sometimes think about it. We felt like our question should be, how's your heart? Like, and it makes you stop for a second. Now, my son, when he was three, I was like, how's your heart, buddy? He's like, I think it's okay, you know? So I like explained to him, that's not what I mean. But it was really being intentional to say, how are you really doing? How the deeper things, things, not just how you doing? And I think that's really helped us have these conversations um, that have been really good, Mm -hmm. really hard, really good. Them telling us sometimes, like, I didn't like this, and this was not good. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and, but talking through it. Um, that's so key. Um, how do, hold on real quick. Um, I understand the timing of the release of your movie, I still believe, came at a difficult time. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, that's the whole thing. Oh. Yes. So we had a movie, you might not even have a clue what I'm talking about. It's called I Still Believe. Anybody have seen the movie I Still Believe? Okay, so a good number of people. If you haven't did a movie in my life, Sharon, it basically shared the testimony that I shared. And um, they had this huge release. The, we were, it was insane. The actors and actresses involved. Like said, a three-year process. It's a three-year process. Yeah, so your so. blood, sweat, and tears, all this kind of stuff going into it. And everything was going right. I mean, I'm talking... They, the analytics of how things were, were like, this is what it's going to be, and we're kind of blown away. And then March 11th, it was supposed to come out March 13th, March 11th, the president declared a global pandemic. 
great timing. And so I remember March 13th hit, the movie could come out, and they started shutting down theaters. And it was a number one movie in America on Friday night. It beat out a Vin Diesel movie um, and a Pixar film. Yeah, kind of crazy. <laughs> and the New York Times, New York Post did an article, and it said, I loved it because it goes, God beats out a superhero because the Vin Diesel film was a superhero film. And I was like, yes, best headline ever, you know. Um, but then it was it, and that was it. Then, like, the theater shut down, and that was it. And so it was difficult. And I'll, we'll leave you with this because I know we got to go. So I'll leave you with this. Um, you know, one of the things, and once again, my wife has these mic drop moments that are just so good. And I remember being super down, super just kind of depressed and going, what in the world? Yeah, I mean, so the, it was in the, the most theaters any Christian film had ever been in by far. I mean, it's like 3,400 theaters, which was almost double what some of the biggest films. And so it was, they would put it in as a blockbuster film. And I'm like, yay. And then they shut them all down. And so I remember just being like, what's, what's the point? Like, why? why? And she pulled me aside and she goes, Jeremy, God never broke his promise. And I was like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> I was like kind of defensive, like, what do you mean? She goes, God never broke his promise. He never promised that your movie was going to stay in the, in the theaters for a long time. He never promised that, you know, it was going to do really well and have this long life and, you know, be this kind of media sensation, whatever you said, something like that. And she goes, <laughs> it was something to that extent. She goes, he didn't promise that. But what he did promise is that he would use it for his glory and his purposes. And I went, okay, that's the reason why we did it in the first place. And I look back now and the stories that I've heard because people watched it at home because it was during COVID. 80 countries have had it. I get stories from people all around the world that talk about it. Um, and so I feel like God has used it in a greater way, not, maybe not in the big scope that it was going to be used, but in the heart scope. And I think we all know that's better, right? So for me, I see what God has done. Do you want to say something? I, I see what God has done. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have two minutes and 47 seconds. Okay, go. <laughs> and I think for me, that was the greatest joy. Just going, you have used it greater than what I could have even imagined. So. Yeah. Um, one thing that, um, so when Jeremy went to visit Melissa in hospital, one of the things that she, um, that she said to him is she said, Jeremy, if one person would meet Jesus because of my life, this is all worth it. And... Again, I want you guys to put yourself in that context, like a girl who wants to live, doesn't want to die, doesn't want to be battling cancer, but she looks at Jeremy and says, if one person comes to Jesus because of everything that I've gone through, it is all worth it. And I think the sweetness of that for us both has been such a gift because in every single opportunity God has given us, in the successes and the failures and the struggles and all of that stuff, that is one thing that has driven us is if there's one person, is if there's one life that is drawn closer, Amen. it's worth it. So, Thank God you bless guys. you guys. So Thank you so much. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys.